Hi guys, welcome to Pi International Education's live classes. So today we will be covering part 3 and part 4 of lecture 2 for SAT. And I hope you all have already watched uh, part 1 and part 2 that we covered um, recently today in the morning at 10. So this is the remaining part of that lecture. So we've already covered, in the last lecture, we already covered an overview of what the writing and language section entails or contains in your SAT English part, right? And we looked at the question pattern. If you can see here, uh, while I'm scrolling down, you'll be getting these notes as well. Don't worry, I'll be emailing them to you or sharing it here on the group. Um, we looked at the different question types that come in the writing and language sections. Uh, we looked at a couple of examples to understand what those questions look like. You'll understand these better when you start solving your textbook that you've been given, the Pi Sat textbook, and I'll be giving you some exercises to do as well. So in today's lecture, I actually want to cover with you, uh, if we quickly go down, I want to cover with you uh, standard English conventions and punctuation rules. So in the Sat, in your writing and language section, you have certain grammar rules that you need to really know uh, very well. So there will be certain types of questions and you'll be judged on your ability to correct or you know notice mistakes in certain grammar um, or punctuation rules uh, and how they are being used within a text. So in today's lecture we'll be covering those punctuation rules that you really have to know. The first punctuation that I want to talk about is the semicolon, right? So a lot of you might have seen the semicolon, but it's, it's very confusing to most how exactly to use them. So in the SAT, the most common use of the semicolon is to connect two closely related independent clauses. Now, what exactly is an independent clause? An independent clause is a part of a sentence, right? A part of a sentence that has a subject and a predicate, which, is com which has a complete subject and predicate but it cannot stand alone. That is why it is a clause, right? And by independent clause means that it makes sense on its own completely. Now, there are two types of clauses. You have independent clauses and you have subordinate clauses. So independent clauses are parts of sentences that have a complete meaning, right? You have either a subject or a verb or a subject and a predicate. You have, you have you know, parts that are making that a complete sense. A subordinate clause is a clause that doesn't really make complete sense on its own. It needs something else to be attached to. So let's take a look at what that, what that is in detail. An independent clause is a string of words that expresses a complete thought and could stand alone as a well-formed sentence. It has a subject and a verb. So example, Teddy loves stuffed bears. Now this could be an entire sentence, right? Because it has a subject which is steady, it has a verb which is loves, stuff bears is the object, right? So it has three parts, a subject and a predicate or subject and a verb, and it actually makes complete sense. It has a full meaning. So it's an example of an independent clause, okay? Let's take a look at another example. They taste great. So here again, you have a subject, they taste great. So taste is your verb, and great is an adjective, right? So here you have three parts of the sentence. It makes complete sense when it stands alone. It can stand alone as a single sentence. So that's how you can identify an independent clause. So when we looked at what the meaning of a semicolon was, it's basically a dot and a comma, right? And it's a punctuation mark that helps to connect two very closely related independent clauses. Right? And those two independent clauses could actually stand as separate independent sentences. And the reason why we use the semicolon is to show that there is a very you know, good connection between those two sentences. They're very relatable or related sentences. So instead of using a full stop, we use a semicolon to show the connection between those two independent clauses. So let's take a look at an example of how we can use the semicolon. Teddy loves stuffed bears. His collection includes 54 specimens. What does this mean? Look at the first part of this sentence. Teddy loves stuffed bears, right? It's telling you that somebody loves stuffed bears. 
the next part says his collection includes 54 specimens so teddy loves bears so much that he has 54 specimens of them right so these two parts of the sentence are very connected it's almost like you could probably put a comma after teddy loves stuffed bears and write therefore he has and and thus his collection includes 54 specimens but instead of doing that, you've actually changed the sentence and you can just put a semicolon to show that these two things are very closely related. So grammatically, you could also separate two sentences like this with a full stop. There is nothing wrong in that, but a semicolon helps to show a connection between these two sentences. All right. So in this second example, if you take a look, Alex cooks his brownies with lard. They taste great. Alex cooks his brownies with lard. And the semicolon here is signifying that there is a close connection between these two parts of the sentence. Alex cooks his brownies with lard. They taste great, right? So instead of me choosing to put a full stop, which would just separate these two sentences, I'm choosing to put a semicolon because it helps show a connection between these two things. So in the first example, you can see here the second clause adds a factual detail that helps demonstrate Steady's love for stuffed bears. In the second example, where we talked about Alex cooking his brownies with lard, the second clause shares the writer's impression of the results of Alex's cooking. So what this tells you is that there, there has to be some connection between the second part of the semicolon and the first part of the semicolon, right? So the before and after test for semicolons. Now think about this. When you are trying to solve questions in SAT regarding the semicolon, they will usually ask you questions where they underline a particular part of a sentence and they'll tell you, um, you know, they'll give you four options and they'll ask you which one is correct. All right. So what are the rules that we just learned? One, you check the part before the semicolon. Can it stand as a single sentence separately? If yes, good. Check the second part of the semicolon, like the part of the sentence after the semicolon. Can it stand alone as a separate sentence? If yes, then good. And if both of these two things are correct and the second sentence is very closely related to the first sentence, then you know that the semicolon is being used correctly. All right. So let's take a look at what you need to be able to identify. A semicolon cannot be used to join an independent and dependent clause. Right? A dependent clause is one that contains a subject and a verb, but that doesn't express a complete thought and couldn't stand alone as a well-formed sentence. For example, because Teddy loves stuffed bears. Like imagine this sentence, right? If you have a sentence, Teddy has 54 stuffed bears, semicolon, because Teddy loves stuffed bears. In this case, my example would be wrong. My use of the semicolon would be wrong. Why? Because a semicolon cannot be used between an independent clause and a dependent clause like this. A dependent clause does not, cannot stand alone as a separate sentence. Can you write because Teddy loves stuffed bears alone as a separate sentence? No, you cannot. So you cannot use semicolon here. Let's move on to the next grammar rule that we have. We're talking about the comma splice. A lot of students make uh, the error of using commas where they really don't belong. And this means you're trying to join two independent clauses with a comma, which is wrong. When do you use a comma? You use a comma to connect two clauses. One could be a dependent clause. One could be an independent clause, right? But you cannot add a comma between two independent clauses. And this, when this happens, when you incorrectly use a comma like this, it's called a comma splice. And this is a very common grammar rule that they judge you on the SAT. For example, let's, look at, let's take a look at a few wrong examples of the use of comma. Teddy loves stuffed bears, comma, his collection includes 54 specimens. So in this case, remember, we learned that this part is an independent clause. This second part is also an independent clause, which means that ideally I should be adding a full stop or a semicolon here, not a comma. So this is an example of a comma splice. You're cutting a sentence up with a comma where it actually should be replaced by a full stop or a semicolon. Another example, Alex cooks his brownies with lard. They taste great. Again, these two parts of the sentence are both independent clauses. So you cannot add a comma. You should rather add a full stop or a semicolon. How do you fix a comma splice error? 
there are different options and the reason why we're going to go through how to fix a comma splice error is because uh, often in the SAT you'll have questions where you're asked to revise or find the solution to an error, right? Like you need to find out the best way to make a sentence correct or the right way to rephrase a sentence. So imagine that you found an error and how do you fix it? How do you fix a comma splice? One, change the comma into a period. Simple, you just change the comma into a full stop, right? Second, add a conjunction. Now, when you are adding a comma, you know that one of your sentence parts should be independent and or an independent clause. And the next part could be a subordinate clause. So when you're talking about subordinate clauses or dependent clauses, that means that that would have to have some sort of conjunction to link it to the independent clause. So a coordinating or subordinating conjunction can often be used to correct a comma splice. So when you have a conjunction like as, and, or, because, while, or, but, any of the two clauses is converted to a dependent or subordinate clause, right? So let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at how they changed the error, the comma splice error and made it correct. Teddy loves stuffed bears, comma, and his collection includes 54 specimens. So what have we done? We've changed this, uh, we've changed this second part of the statement from an independent clause into a subordinate clause because now we have a conjunction that's starting it. Now, remember what subordinate clauses were or dependent clauses were? They were parts of sentences that cannot stand alone. They cannot be considered a full sentence. If I just take a look at this sentence, it starts with and, right? So I cannot consider it a full sentence. So now that I've done this, using a comma here is correct. Let's take a look at another example. Because Alex cooks his brownies with lard, comma, they taste great. Here, instead of the second part, I have actually changed the first part of my sentence and I've put a because here, which means adding this conjunction makes this part of my sentence a dependent or a subordinate clause. It cannot stand alone. And now my use of the comma here is correct. The third option of how to correct these comma splice errors is you use a semicolon in place of the comma. So like we mentioned before, if you want to connect two independent clauses, you can add a semicolon if the two sentences are closely related. So you can do just do that and it'll fix the problem. Let's move on to the next rule, uh, the colon, right? The colon is just two dots and why do you use it? You use it after a statement that introduces a list, a self-contained quotation, an explanation or an example. So let's take a look at a few examples. The English language abounds with irregular verbs. Se the colon, drink, drank, drunk, semicolon, break, broke, broken, semicolon, swim, swam, swam, shrink, shrank, shrunken, etc, etc, etc. So here they are giving you a statement. What is the statement? The statement is the English language abounds with irregular verbs. And then what do they do? They've given you examples of that. So all of these parts you see here, they're all examples of the first statement over here. So what does that tell you? That you can use a colon to introduce examples for a specific statement you make, right? For example, I could say, I love eating vegetables or I love eating fruits, apples. Then I could put a colon, apples, oranges, bananas, strawberries, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so let's take a look at one more example to understand this better. Lincoln's Gettysburg address began with the following preamble. And then you put a quote. So even quotation marks, you can add. Sorry about that. So you can add quotation marks as well when you're trying to introduce a quote. S sorry. So you can add a colon when you want to introduce a quote, right? So Lincoln's Gettysburg address began with the following preamble. You put a colon to introduce a quotation. So then you have the quotation, okay? And what about this? There is a difference, right? Lincoln's Gettysburg address begins with, you cannot use a colon when your quote is embedded or part of your sentence. So there's a difference between this sentence over here and this sentence over here, right? So what's the difference between this first sentence 
Over here in the first sentence, you have mentioned with the following preamble and then you've put a colon. But in the second part, this is a complete sentence and it's just flowing along. Lincoln's Gettysburg address begins with and then the quote is part of the sentence. So you cannot use a colon when the quote is part of the sentence. Okay. Let's move on to look at some of the common uses of colons, right? One, it's used to announce, introduce or direct attention to a list, a noun or noun phrase, a quotation like we already see, saw before, or an example or explanation, right? Let's take a look at one of each of these in turn. One, we use a colon when we introduce a series or a list. Let's take a look at, um, you know, what this could entail. We covered many of the fundamentals in our writing class, colon, grammar, punctuation, style, and voice. So here you have a statement, right? And then you are introducing a list of the things that were covered in the class using what you have a colon, using a colon to introduce that list. Then you can also use it, you know, before noun or noun phrase examples. My roommate gave me the things I needed most. What were those? companionship and quiet. So here, this second part is actually giving you an example of the things that are mentioned in the previous part. So it's giving a, not exactly an explanation, but it's kind of giving an example of the things, right? Quotation, Shakespeare said it best. And then you put colon, and then you put the quotation. Then you have answers or examples or explanations. Many graduate students discover that there is a dark side to academia and then you follow it with an explanation colon late nights high stress and a crippling addiction to caffeinated beverages right so you have here a sentence which is saying something it is giving you a statement and then you are adding an explanation to it therefore you're adding why why do graduate students feel that there's a dark side to academia because of the late nights, high stress, and crippling addiction to caffeinated beverages. You can also use a colon to join sentences, right? So when do you use colons to join sentences? When the second sentence summarizes, sharpens, or explains the first. Let's take a look at an example. Life is like a puzzle. And then what do you do? You add the second part. Half the fun is in trying to work it out. So this is not exactly an ex not exactly an explanation, but it's adding to the first part of the sentence, right? And it's linked to it. It's kind of sharpening or providing a stronger elaboration of the first part of the sentence. Another reason why you can use colons is to express time in titles and as part of other writing conventions. Let's take a look at a few um, of these rules. With numbers, colons are used to separate units of time. You already know that. Uh, you know, when you have verses or chapters from the Bible, when you have examples, you know, for example, when you have a book and then you just want to add, let's say, uh, the name of something you can use. For example, in this situation, you have New York, NY, you know, colon, Walker and Co. Subtitles, you can use colons are used to separate titles from subtitles, etc. These are the more small uh, places where you use colons. Okay, let's take a look now at common colon mistakes. What are the main mistakes that people make? One, using a colon between a verb and its object or complement. Let's take a look at an example. The very best peaches are, the very best peaches are those that are grown in the great state of Georgia. There is a problem here because after R, between R and those, R is a verb, right? The very best peaches are those that are grown in. Those here is referring to the object, right? So here, between your verb and your object or your complement, you cannot use your colon. All right, remember that. Next, using a colon between a preposition and its object. My favorite cake is made of, of is a preposition. So when you have a preposition, you cannot immediately follow it up with a colon. You, using a colon here would be incorrect. Thirdly, using a colon after such as including especially and similar phrases. So. The, the problem with this specific example is that when we use a colon, remember that the part of the sentence before the colon has to be a complete thought. 
And if your sentence, if your first sentence ends with something like such as including, especially, then it is not a complete sentence. So you cannot place a colon there. Let's take a look at an example. There are many different types of paper, including college rule, wide rule, and plain copy paper. Here, because you are using the word including, you're not supposed to use a colon because this part of the sentence, this first part, is not a complete thought. It's not an independent clause. All right? So let's move on to the next grammar rule that we have. We have the dash. So if you have, uh, you know, you have, when you use the dash, you can use it either singly with just one dash or you could use it in pairs. So we'll take a look at that in turn. Note the dash is not to be confused with the hyphen. There is a difference. There are two separate punctuation marks. One is the dash and then there's the hyphen. Hyphens are usually found between two words, right? For example, you have numbers, um, 26, 20 hyphen six. Those shorter dashes that you see are actually hyphens. They're not the same as dash. And we'll take a look at how they're used in a sentence. Just like the rule for colons, what comes before the single dash must be an independent clause. It must be able to read as a complete sentence all on its own. Okay, remember that. And why do we use the dash? It could follow with an additional thought. What, whenever you put a dash, the thought after the dash could be uh, an added information or it could be an explanation. It could be um, some part of the sentence to add more meaning to the previous sentence. So let's take a look at how they're used, all right? So let's take a look at this first example. Sitting at dinner that night, Finn, dash, usually a talkative chap, dash, refused to answer a single question about his day. In this case, you can see they've used a pair of dashes. Now, when you use a pair of dashes, remember that whatever you place within the two dashes can be removed from the sentence without changing the meaning or without changing the grammatical correctness of the sentence. So you can easily just take out the part between the two dashes and the sentence, rest of the sentence will still remain grammatically correct. So for example, here you can see sitting at dinner that night, Finn, if I don't have this dash and this part, I can still read the sentence. Sitting at dinner that night, Finn refused to answer a single question about his day. What does this mean? That you use dashes to kind of just add some extra information to the sentence to make to make the reader know a little bit more about what is being spoken of. All right. How do you know if the dashes are being used correctly or not? Pair them up. Look out for pairs of mismatched punctuations. Usually when you look at uh, sad questions regarding paired punctuation marks, uh, you will find errors when they're using one dash and then to end that small phrase, they'll use a comma or a semicolon. In most cases, this might be incorrect because you use a pair of dashes or a pair of commas, right? Um, so when they come in pairs, you have to make sure that it's being used correctly. And, uh, you know, if the pair is not looking right, like there's one full stop, there's one comma, one dash or one semicolon and one uh, comma, then it may not be, uh, you know, correct, depending on the sentence, of course. So, for example, let's take a look at this one. Learning to ride a unicycle, a time-consuming endeavor, comma, is easy if you don't mind a few bumps and bruises. So here, can you tell me what the mistake was? The mistake in this particular sentence is in the pairing of the punctuation marks. So in the first part, they've given a comma. And in the second part, they've ended it with a dash. So this is wrong. Either you should use both commas or you should use a dash here as well. Learning to ride a bicycle, dash, a time-consuming endeavor, adding some extra information, dash, is easy if you don't mind a few bumps and bruises, all right? Okay, so the top comma tip that we have is exaggerate the pause. If you're wondering if a comma is correct, read the sentence through the emphasis, through, and emphasize the pause the comma creates. If it sounds very weird to your ears, probably wrong. So how do you know whether, uh, now we're moving on to comma, how do you know whether the use of a comma is correct or not? Commas are usually used to create pauses in sentences. So if there shouldn't really be a pause, maybe the use of the comma isn't right. Okay, so try to practice these grammar rules while you're going along. Let's move on to the apostrophe. 
uh, why are apostrophes used when we want to use contractions contractions are when you try to join two words and make it smaller a lot of you already know about apostrophes for example they are do not didn't so apostrophes are these like tiny uh, you know dashes that you, uh, not really dashes but just like uh, a comma on the top and they're used to join two words together to make them short So next we have your possessive pronouns. Possessive pronouns never use apostrophes. What does that mean? Yours, his, hers. Possessive pronouns basically are words that show you possession uh, regarding, um, you know, either it could be with your, her, our, their, words like these are called pronouns. And when you want to show possession using these pronouns and they're called possessive pronouns, okay? So the correct way to do it would be yours, hers, ours, theirs, without your apostrophe. So remember that. The only single thing is with the word it and is, right? It's. So it's is a possessive pronoun where we don't use the apostrophe. But if you want to use a contraction for it is, then you use the apostrophe. So it's, you have to make sure that you're not confused with it's and it is. You have singular possessive, the rule to make a singular noun possessive, add an apostrophe and an S. So how do you make a specific uh, word possessive? You just add a apostrophe and then you add an S. Like it's my cat's collar. So then you add apostrophe and an S. How do you make a plural word possessive? If it already has an S at the end, then you just put an apostrophe after the S and you do not add an S after that. So if a, if a word that is already plural, if it ends with an S, then you just put an apostrophe at the end. You do not add another S. Okay, let's take a look at a few tricky uh, plural possessives, right? When you have a noun, which is plural, right? And it doesn't end with an S. Then what do you do? You just follow the same rule. You add an apostrophe and you add an S. So if you have a word like children, it is plural, yes, but it doesn't end with an S. So you have to put an apostrophe and then add it with an S and the same goes for words like men, women, mice and dice. All right. So that was for uh, today's lecture. I really hope that you have watched all the parts of this lecture and you're following through. I hope you're not having any trouble. And for you to exercise whatever we have learned, uh, I will be emailing you uh, the materials for the lectures that we have already had. And I hope all of you have the PySAT book. I want you to actually solve uh, the writing and language section from page number, this this is the page that I want you to solve. It's page number 58 in your PISAT book, okay? It's the language and writing test of your practice test one in the book. So make sure that you're solving that and I'll see you in the next online class with lecture number three.